Right, well, um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, and welcome to this panel session presented by the BVI Arbitration Group in conjunction with the BVI International Arbitration Centre, uh, Arbitration Post-Pandemic, uh, Out of Adversity Comes an Opportunity, uh, the Rise of Offshore Arbitration Centres. Uh, the BVI Arbitration Group is a group of professionals uh, interested in the promotion of arbitration and of the BVI IAC. It's open to members from all over the world, and indeed its members uh, are based not just in the BVI, uh, but, uh, as I said, around the world. The panel discussion uh, that we're now doing is one example of our work, and if you're not a member, uh, then do go to the BVI IAC website uh, and complete the application, or just email the IAC or me uh, for the form. I will be moderating the panel. I'm Nick Burkill. I'm the chair of the BVI Arbitration Group and a partner uh, in OGIA in the BVI. Um, at the risk of being discourteous to our uh, highly distinguished panel, uh, I'm going to introduce them with only a little more detail uh, than I did myself, since I suspect uh, they are well known to you, and I know they are keen to start the discussion. Uh, Dame Elizabeth Gloucester uh, was Vice President uh, of the Civil Division of the English Court of Appeal after serving as a judge of the Commercial Court and a career as a Commercial and Chancery Silk. Amongst other things, she now sits as an arbitrator in a wide range of cases. Natalie Reed uh, is a partner in Debevoise and Plimpton's International Dispute Resolution Group based in New York uh, and is also chair of the firm's Caribbean practice. She too regularly sits uh, as an arbitrator in a wide range of cases, uh, as well as representing parties in complex arbitration uh, and litigation matters. Uh, Maxime Osacci is an associate with Debevoise and Plimpton's International Dispute Resolution Group as well, and is based in London, having previously practiced in Moscow. Uh, and he represents parties in a wide range of complex arbitrations. Uh, Vivek uh, Kapoor also acts as counsel and advocate in complex commercial and investor state disputes, practicing from chambers uh, in London at 39 Essex Street and also sits as an arbitrator. He's recognized as one of the UK's leading arbitration specialists, although his practice is global. Uh, Francois Lassalle, uh, is the CEO of the BVI IAC and has been a driving force between the IAC's development and has really been instrumental in the move of the BVI IAC towards acceptance uh, as a leading offshore arbitration centre. Now, with those uh, two brief uh, introductions, what we intend to do uh, is set the scene um, uh, a little before opening up the discussion um, please do feel free to ask questions using the Q&A facility, uh, and I'll do my best uh, to raise them. Um, so um, the first question that I wanted us to uh, address was the lessons that we should draw from the pandemic uh, and the disputes community's adaptation to remote uh, arbitration. Um, Maxime, I'm going to... Um, give this to you first um, to consider the regulatory infrastructure. And you're on mute. Thank you very much, Nick. <laughs> um, good welcome. morning, um, good afternoon, and um, good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. So the first thing one needs to consider when deciding whether to hold a hearing remotely or in person is whether remote hearing is permissible as a matter of national law and arbitration rules. Arbitration is often as good as its ultimate product, an arbitral award. And if courts are not prepared to recognize and enforce that product, for example, because national law requires that a hearing be held in person and not remotely, the whole process may become frustrated very easily and very quickly. I'm going to give you a summary of what the position is right away. To my knowledge, no developed arbitral jurisdiction or arbitration rules prohibit or require a remote hearing. No court in any developed jurisdiction has thus far refused to recognize and enforce an arbitral award 
on the basis that the hearing in the underlying arbitration was conducted remotely. The devil, of course, is in the details. And the fact that it has not happened yet doesn't mean that it won't happen in future. And it certainly doesn't mean that you shouldn't remain alert to the risks which may sometimes arise in the context of virtual hearings. So let's take a closer look at the regulatory framework applicable to remote hearings. Main, most national laws and arbitration rules do not say anything about remote hearings or say very little. There are exceptions such as Article 19 of the 2021 rules of the BVI International Arbitration Center. And that provision expressly states that arbitral tribunal may decide to have hearings entirely conducted remotely. There are also provisions in the Dutch Civil Procedure Code saying that the tribunal may determine that a witness, an expert, or a party have direct contact with the arbitral tribunal by electronic means in appropriate circumstances. But such provisions are relatively rare, and many statutes and rules remain silent on the question of remote hearings. Where arbitration rules do not deal with remote hearings expressly, the question arises whether you can still have a remote hearing. And the short answer is generally yes. Tribunals' broad case man management powers include power to make directions with respect to the conduct of a hearing. There's also a party's fundamental right to a hearing recognized in all developed jurisdictions. The combination of those two means that you can have a virtual hearing, even in the absence of express provisions to that effect. Now, importantly, arbitral institutions have confirmed this position in the guidance they issued at the onset of the pandemic to assist users as they were beginning to navigate the virtual landscape. There was some debate as to whether a right to a hearing is limited to a physical hearing or whether it also encompasses a virtual hearing. A major survey conducted by the International Council for Commercial Arbitration, or ICAR, on the right to a physical hearing confirmed that in the vast majority of jurisdictions surveyed, there's no right to a physical hearing in arbitration. And the right to an oral hearing, therefore, does not necessarily exclude holding it through video conferencing. What rules and statutes say or do not say about remote hearings is obviously important. But the ultimate test for any remote hearing is whether the resulting award can withstand scrutiny by national courts. There have today been only a handful of court cases dealing with remote hearings and arbitration. Challenges were brought on the basis of possible breaches of the party's right to be heard and to be treated equally due to the fact that a hearing or a portion of the hearing was conducted remotely. Now, I already mentioned none of these challenges were successful. Against this backdrop, one could think that the fact that there have only been a handful of award challenges arising out of remote hearings during a relatively long period of time, we're now more than 20 months into the pandemic, could be considered as an implicit indication or acknowledgement of the fact that remote hearings are in fact permissible, and more importantly, now an accepted form of hearings and arbitration. The much discussed Austrian Supreme Court decision from July 2020, the first national Supreme Court decision addressing whether conducting a remote hearing over the objection of a party may violate due process, confirms precisely this. The case involved a challenge to an arbitral tribunal sitting under the rules of the Vienna International Arbitration Rules, or VIAG, over its decision to conduct an evidentiary hearing remotely by video conference. The Supreme Court expressly confirmed that remote hearings are generally permissible as a matter of Austrian law at least, and that tribunals have wide discretion as to the organization and conduct of the proceedings. Importantly, the court also clarified that there's a strong presumption that remote hearings are legitimate and a party wanting to challenge a remote hearing must use sufficiently strong countervailing factual considerations, as the court put it. Now, finally, the, the, the situation can, of course, become a bit more complicated enforcement-wise, where a virtual hearing was held against the party's agreement. In other words, both parties want to have a physical hearing, but the tribunal, for whatever reason, decide that there must be um, virtual hearing. Um, I don't think there have been any decisions addressing this question specifically. And it's possible in that scenario 
that there, there, there could be serious enforcement risks. Although even in that scenario, you would still need to demonstrate in most jurisdictions that the fact that the hearing was held remotely had a material impact on the outcome of the case or led to substantial injustice. Thanks so much, Maxim. And uh, I'm going to now um, uh, uh, throw it over to uh, Francois um, and ask you, Francois, to address um, both the importance of the physical infrastructure uh, and um, what the BVI IAC should learn from the pandemic. Okay. Um, the I'm not on mute. No. Um, good. Uh, <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, the well, the physical infrastructure is is critical. I mean. The, the time of you know being able to get away with a poor connection and a bad webcam and and extremely bad sound um, to go through a hearing um, or over and I think you know if if there is one thing that the pandemic triggered is really a, a sophistication of the arbitration community uh, with regards to technologies. Um, supporting uh, arbitration at a time where international travel um, was no longer possible. Um, I think that the physical infrastructure that institutions have access to, so you, you're talking about hearing centers and the technology that comes with it, um, is important to the extent that um, a lot of parties and tribunals uh, are, are not born equal. And, and, and for a lot of uh, individuals and firms, uh, it's pretty pointless to, to invest in, in, in the type of technology that institutions can, um, can, can, can have internally. Um, and so we, as, as an institution, have been used a number of times in the past two years, more so than before, uh, by, by law firms and individual arbitrators uh, to facilitate um, hybrid um, uh, proceedings uh, and whether the hearings or case management conferences or, or you know it doesn't matter but people have come to us to one benefit from my experience uh, from our experience um, and, and and second to, to benefit from from our technology um, and I think this is this is going to to continue um, to answer the second part of the question, um, what did we learn from the pandemic? Well, actually, we, um, as an institution, got um, lucky, or, or I'd rather say we, we cheated a bit, because from inception, uh, about five years ago, we, you know, we're the only institution in a low-lying island in a hurricane corridor. So we, we always knew that there might be situations where we would have to work remotely. I mean, the, the entire staff of the arbitration center is on laptops rather than normal computers. We, we had the webcam. So, so when nobody could buy a webcam at the start of the pandemic, we already had them. Um, so so, so we, we didn't learn, uh, we, we didn't have to change our business model uh, in, in order to, to handle uh, the, the evolution of arbitration uh, during the pandemic. Um, but what we've learned is, you know, um, how do you consistently support your clients remotely? Uh, whereas before, most of our interactions with arbitrators and parties was at the center. Um, now, most of our interactions are online and, 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 and this is different. And, you know, we, we're not having the same conversations. You know, it, it's no longer do you want tea and coffee in your room? It's when do you want to do your testing? And, and you know, is your e-band already? And what does it look like? And, you, you know, so, so we've had to relearn some of those conversations that, you know, we, we took from granted for the first four years of our existence. Um, but I think, you know, um, not only did, did, did we go through that um, pretty seamlessly, but I think uh, the arbitration community as a whole has, has evolved really quickly uh, during the pandemic. And, you know, we, we used to get some 
really basic questions. Uh, we we do not get those questions anymore, and I think you know the the the, the bar, the, the the admission bar to to arbitration now involves some sort of technical skill set uh, to handle oneself um, it remotely. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? The uh, the benefits of a major hurricane uh, in getting you ready for a pandemic. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, Vivek, um, so developing um, th this theme, would you say that uh, virtual hearings uh, strengthen the arbitration process? Thank, thanks, Nick, um, and thank, thanks for the uh, invite. I think the simply put, the answer is yes. Uh, a year ago, if you'd asked me that question, I would have said subject to technology working, but as uh, Francois said, I think we've uh, made a very significant leap in that regard and uh, technology now works. And I think virtual hearings have strengthened the practice. And I'm conscious of the fact that, you know, a, a lot of us focus on the high end of the dispute market, but there is a significant number of small and medium sized cases which have tremendously benefited technology because they can be cheaply done uh, even in cases where there is an issue of a quality of arms you have a uh, you know David uh, V. Goliath situation technology is a, a great leveler and I think it's really helped with the efficiency and uh, cost effectiveness because uh, a growing criticism of arbitration is it's becoming costly it's becoming uh, lengthy and I think virtual hearings uh, can play a very important role even in uh, bigger cases i think at least my view is that uh, i don't think interim hearings can uh, be done in person now it's it's going to be always virtual and even for jurisdictional issues you can do it virtually when it comes to final hearings i still think there will be a preference to do some in person and or in a hybrid mode but uh, i think overall uh, technology has uh, significantly uh, changed the way arbitration is done and I think virtual hearings have uh, significantly helped the process. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point about um, uh, uh, final hearings. I mean, I, I did a trial earlier this year um, and there are advantages and disadvantages. And uh, um, But one advantage actually is that you can see the witnesses um, uh, face in quite a lot of detail <laughs> um, if you do it remotely um, uh, and uh, uh, I, I certainly found that helpful but um, Maxime looking at this uh, the other way around um, uh, what, are, what are the obstacles that um, you identify to the efficacy of remote hearings and, and being positive about it um, how can they be overcome? Um, thank you, Nick. Um, there are a number of obstacles or, or, or difficulties related to virtual hearings, and I'm, 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 I'm conscious that this part of the presentation may be may prove to be the most controversial because um, what 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 I may view as as, a, as an obstacle, others would would not consider as as, as a serious um, impediment um, to, to to holding a hearing remotely. So I think broadly speaking, we're looking at uh, three types of difficulties relating to virtual hearings. First, the loss of human interaction. Um, second, the assessment of evidence by arbitral tribunals. And finally, difficulties relating to technical issues and logistics. Well, starting with the first, um, loss of human interaction from the council perspective, there are concerns regarding the impact of virtual hearings on the effectiveness of their oral advocacy particularly when it comes to testing witnesses' credibility. As um, um, one very famous advocate has, has, has put it, uh, the nature of oral advocacy is that it's almost uh, tactile. So uh, you need to be able to connect with the tribunal. You need to be able to connect with the witness and with other participants um, of, of the hearing. And that arguably is a lot easier to do when you have everyone in the room. Also from counsel slash uh, client's perspective, uh, interacting with your team in virtual environment is a bit more difficult. Yes, you can use WhatsApp messages, um, you can send emails, but that is no substitute to proper real-life interaction. And perhaps from the tribunal's perspective as well, some arbitrators may find it 
more difficult to make effective interventions in a remote hearing, to ask questions or to police the proceedings when necessary. So some may feel less in control when conducting a virtual trial and also more inclined to leave questions to the end of the trial rather than asking them if and when, whenever they, they, they rise. Now, second group of difficulties dealing with the assessment of evidence, and again, based on some um, anecdotal evidence I've been able to uh, find, according to some arbitrators, um, assessing evidence remotely, um, again, uh, may sometimes prove difficult. You don't get the same feel for the witness, they say. You don't have the same chemistry as you do in a normal physical hearing. And then there is also a risk of witness tampering, as, as, as some suggest, through influencing a witness testimony prior to the hearing, or perhaps feeding the witness information on the other evidence it used during the course of the hearing. And finally, technology. Uh, many arbitrators and users of arbitration, I think, are more technologically savvy these days. But some are still not fully at ease with um, um, remote hearings. And that may cause difficulties for all participants of the process. And even when we assume the requisite level of knowledge and understanding of technology, the nature of the remote hearings is such that they are vulnerable to occasional technical hiccups. And the risk of that happening is, is even higher when you have a complex hearing. And these hearings sometimes take um, weeks, if not, if not months. Now, to be clear, um, um, Nick, um, um, what I've just outlined, <laughs> th these are concerns which are sometimes expressed with respect to remote hearings. Um, I'm not suggesting that I agree with these criticisms, but I think um, I'd like to, to pause here and, and see if, if anyone has any, any views on anything what I just said. Well, I'm going to come in on my section of the talk, so I don't want to interrupt now, but I've got lots of comments with the views, <laughs> or they're not your views you've brought forward. Um, but I, I'll, I'll wait my turn, like the good well, girl. I, I yes, I mean, I <laughs> thank you so much, <laughs> Um I mean, I think that um, what I was wanting to do was to set up um, uh, the discussion uh, in the way that we have, and then uh, everyone's been um, waiting for uh, Liz and Natalie to join in, um, particularly providing the arbitrator's um, viewpoint. Um, and I think probably that's um, a good opportunity for us to um, go straight on to that. Um, and uh, I, I think Natalie first. Um, this is all uh, under the broad heading of the question um, uh, of the future uh, for arbitration and uh, international dispute resolution more broadly post-pandemic, uh, and in particular whether offshore arbitration centres are now uh, more attractive. But I think there's a load of detailed questions um, that I, I've, I think Liz has been uh, adverting to um, that, that get covered in that. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Nick, um, and to Maxime, Francois and Vivek for kind of setting things up uh, so well. Uh, Liz and I have a range of opinions on this, and I'm sure that we'll be uh, uh, getting into them now. Um, one thing that I will say, and one thing that struck me in you know, sort of listening to Maxime and Vivek in particular, um, is uh, uh, sort of the, the point at which we are now, after two years of this experience, um, I, I, I'm not the only person to, to make this observation, but I think that in the last two years, uh, international arbitral practice, so on both, in fact, uh, uh, for all the players, for counsel, for the parties, and for arbitrators, has come more in terms of, you know, sort of coming up the, the, um, the learning curve for uh, adapting to virtual hearings and the use of technology in particular has come further in the last two years because everybody had to do it than I think we would otherwise have seen in the absence of the pandemic. And that's important because 
if you think about you know sort of the um, the ease of adaptation of some of these points, I'm not sure that you would have had as widespread a consensus, for example, on the idea that virtual hearings can be as fair and effective as physical hearings if you weren't in a situation where you had no alternative because nobody was able to travel anywhere. So what we've been is in a massive global experiment where we've all had to make do because the alternative is to have no hearings for as long as you know, sort of travel and health restrictions applied. The reason that I want to start with that is that I think that it has, at least in my own experience, you know, sort of really informed the way that all the participants in the process have responded. So let's take, you know, sort of the points that uh, Maxim just touched on. When it comes to oral advocacy, certainly for those of us who straddle uh, international arbitration and domestic litigation, whether as counsel, arbitrator, judge, as in Liz's case. Um, we all know um, of advocates who believe that they are more effective when they can have a physical space and presence, when they can gesticulate, when they can speak as if they were trying to persuade a jury as opposed to a panel of three sophisticated arbitrators. Um, part of the experiment I think we've all been through and picking up especially on, on Vivek's point, I think for procedural conferences, we now know of course they are as effective um, as they would be, um, frankly, perhaps even more effective um, than they would be in person. Uh, for discrete questions, you know, sort of arguments about bifurcation or uh, some of those bifurcated issues like jurisdiction. Again, I, I think what we've seen is, at least in my own experience, can be quite effective, subject to a point that I'll come back to later about the, 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 the rhythm and the dynamic within this somewhat artificial environment. The biggest variation, I think, really has been in hearings that involve witness evidence, for the most part, you know, sort of merits hearings. Uh, there, I think, you will, I have seen a far more variation in terms of how effective presentations have been, how effective witness examination has been, um, how well witnesses um, come across in, um, you know, sort of in, in this setting, um, which I think will inevitably have some impact on the way in which arbitrators receive and then assess that evidence. I don't know honestly how material that impact is because arbitrators recognize that this is a more artificial environment. We recognize that our job, our responsibility as always is to focus on the substance of the evidence. Of course, you know, sort of credibility assessments are, are key to that. But you're again, sort of, you know, uh, 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 in my opinion, um, you know, uh, a, a, a responsible arbitrator is not going to be swayed by the fact that somebody was looking off in a particular direction because of where the camera was, um, as opposed to focusing on that person's oral evidence in the context of, of the whole case. I, I had stuck a pin earlier in the question of sort of the, the dynamic. That's the one thing that I think we haven't yet cracked, the nut we haven't yet cracked which is whether for bandwidth, external noise or other reasons, um, we have all uh, sort of settled on the practice that when one person is speaking, everyone else is on mute. The impact that has, I think, is to further um, uh, distinguish this experience from the normal experience that you would have in a hearing. You would hear the papers rustling, you would get visual and non-visual cues to whether or not the chair of the tribunal or a member of the tribunal was getting anxious and really wanted to ask a question. Um, so different panels, I think, have reacted to that in different ways. In a number of the hearings I've been involved with, the panel has elected to wait until the end to ask questions so that you didn't have this awkward, and you know, Maxim uh, uh, referred to this earlier, you didn't have this awkward um, dynamic where people weren't sure if they were asking a question, they were leery of interrupting, um, and therefore you had a much more stilted and formal presentation than you might get before, for example, an arbitral panel that would be more of a so-called hot bench. 
So I'll pause there. Thanks, Natalie. Um, Nick, shall I now go on? Is that my turn has been reached? Well, hi, hi everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's cool to be on this panel. Uh, virtual court and arbitral hearings were born of necessity, as we all know. But as normality slowly returns, we must consider, I think, very seriously where this leaves us. We've made the leap or rather been pushed into online dispute resolution. Now is the time to decide how to make use of it. Um, in the normal times that are hopefully returning. As the UK Lord Chancellor said in 2020, returning to the status quo would be a massively missed opportunity. And that is really my theme today. The experience that I've gained doing large numbers of evidentiary substantive hearings, as well as procedural hearings over the last two years of the pandemic, makes me a massive uh, arbitrator in favor of virtual hearings where possible. Let me address some of the points that people have raised. First of all, advocacy. Council need to up their game. Some of them have seen the message. They've got their cameras absolutely correctly positioned in distance terms. You know, we don't see them so up face to face that they're spitting at us. At the same time, they've honed their advocacy skills and they're just as effective. I simply disagree um, quite strongly with the idea that oral advocacy is touchy feely, it's tactile. Personally, I think that's rubbish. I think there needs to be an adaptation, but I don't feel the need for quotes chemistry. I don't feel I've lost um, that, um, certainly so far as council are concerned uh, with the advent of virtual hearing. Uh, I've seen some council who may be brilliant as court performers who are absolutely useless on screen because they don't realize you do have to look like Gregory Peck, sorry, that dates me a bit, or, or um, whoever, um, Harrison Ford, you, 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 probably that dates me even more. Um, you, you have got to get your act together and present properly. What about witness evidence? Well, there's been a lot of talk about the online disinhibition effect in other words, that the witness feels relaxed from the game, so comfortable that it's he or she is not taking the proceedings seriously. Worse, perhaps, there is a suggestion that online disinhibition enables the witness to tell lies more effectively. Um, I, I don't really agree with that. Again, I think it's necessary to make sure your witness is giving his or her testimony to best advantage. I think it's up to the arbitrator to make sure that the witness who you think is going to be a lying toe rag is not sitting right at the end of the room um, so you can't see his facial uh, expressions or see some bit of his body language. Secondly, I think it's very important that the parties agree a protocol as to what documents the witness has in front of him or her. I think it's very important from my point of view, I mean, I, I'd leave it to party autonomy probably, but from my point of view, I think the witness needs to have control of the documents. He needs to be able to flip to the previous page, whether electronically or in hard copy. I also think, and if I were counsel, I would insist that he have access to the live note transcript. Why should everybody apart from the witness himself see what he said foolishly five minutes ago. I, I, I think he should have the ability to do that. That's quite um, controversial. But, but my experience is that I can certainly tell when a witness is lying on screen just as well or as poorly as I could when he was appearing or she was appearing in front of me. I don't need that real life chemistry. Um, I think it's questionable to what extent body language tells you whether a witness is lying or not. 
um, at the end of the day, one has to go back to the documents in commercial arbitration and see how the oral testimony stacks up um, with, with that. Uh, so I'm a big pro for, uh, and I find it just as easy to assess the value of evidence online. The, 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 um, I don't think there's any problem from the panel. Uh, some arbitrators have suggested that uh, one loses one's advocate ability as a member of the tribunal. You can't persuade, seduce or bully a co-member of the tribunal in the way that one could if one's all sitting in the same room. Well, I don't agree with that either. I think the most interesting point is whether arbitrators have lost their ability, ability to come in with a, a searching question, a probing question at the right time, not at the end, because at the end of the examination, it's too late. At the end of submissions, it's too late. Um, I hope I haven't been interrupting too much in hearings, but I haven't found it that difficult, particularly where there's a live note transcript, so one knows where one is. I haven't found it that difficult to come in and ask questions, although I know some of my colleagues ha have found it so. Uh, I mean, I could go on forever, but I think that's my my bit really, Nick. No, thanks so much for that. Uh, um, and uh, um, so you don't see um, an issue with the, the panel of three not being in the same room? No, no because we can always go to a breakout room yeah. and we can always um, email or WhatsApp each other during the show, in fact, more yeah. easily, um, much more easily to communicate. And I've um, recently, the last three weeks, I've been sitting in the Bermuda Court of Appeal. And again, it's just as easy at breakout room time to communicate. It's just as easy to email co-arbitrators co during the hearing to say, come on, we must stop this witness or, you know, this submission <laughs> is stupid, whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I, haven't, I haven't had a problem. I'd be interested to see what Natalie thinks about not being in the same room with co-arbitrators. I agree. I haven't had a problem either. And I think uh, one of the you know, marked benefits of everybody being that much more used to uh, whether you have a separate room, whether it's a breakout room, whether the tribunal has a separate link on a different video platform to reduce all risk yeah. of you know, sort of party intrusion. Um, is it makes it that much easier to both confer before a hearing and begin deliberations right after. In the in-person world where you would have to, you know, sort of book a certain days and know that you had one day or one and a half days after a hearing where you were all physically going to be in the same place. So that was when you were going to start deliberations. And then you would try and find some other time that was common on your calendar. What I found is when nobody needs to leave where they are, it becomes that much easier to deliberate uh, by video. And just like Liz, I found no difference between the interactions, the candor um, that you have among tribunal members, whether in person or virtually. Yeah, no, that's great, thank you. And, um, uh, uh, and that's fascinating, obviously, to hear the arbitrator's um, side of this. Um, what I wanted next to do is to ask uh, Vivek, although he sits as an arbitrator, to provide the um, uh, advocate's view. But perhaps um, uh, when I start doing that, um, you could um, uh, also address the point that Ed Cross has made uh, in the Q&A. Um, and Ed, uh, thanks very much indeed for that. At the um, just to, uh, if I can, just read it out. Um, I think you have to be very careful in how you prepare um, a witness to give evidence in front of a screen and to give a lot of thought to the physical setup. A witness can look very shifty if you have too many screens and if the camera is not directly at the eye line. Also, if you have multiple video faces appearing across the main screen, this can cause the witness's eyes to flit around. And that looks evasive. Uh, best to have one speak of, uh, have on speak of you, so they're only looking in one place. Uh, and then I'll just hand over to you now, Vivek. Uh, thanks, Nick. I, I think that 
as, as Liz said, I think as, as an advocate, uh, advocacy on uh, a virtual platform is more efficient. You know, you, you need to be more pointed. A lot of the dramatics don't work. You need to, uh, you know, be, be very um, specific with where you're going. And, uh, you know, so some, some of the antics that sometimes uh, you, you, you can bring into a, a, a physical hearing don't work. I think personally, uh, there is a bit of a learning curve because you need to adjust your few things. One of the things that I've learned is it's slightly harder to concentrate uh, when you, uh, you're doing advocacy on a virtual platform because you're sitting alone in a room and, you know, there sometimes is a moment where there is a blip, which, uh, you know, may not happen when you're in the room. But I think that's a point you need to be slightly conscious about. Time zones also require some adjustment of, you know, by the work in Asia, so done those 7 a.m. and then some, some late evenings. But I think th th those are points that can be very easily dealt with. Something to address the, the question that was asked, I think uh, what is very helpful is to have all witnesses just have a basic, uh, you know, a uh, couple of minutes from the service provider about you know the screens about the technology about bundles about everything because that that makes it very easy both for counsel as well as for arbitrators because no one is bumbling around and getting nervous with uh, you know uh, finding bundles finding uh, things and i think that that's that's something that is very very useful as i, I think as liz said the, the the arbitrators are usually able to see through uh, you know, if somebody is just plain nervous or somebody is being naughty. Though I do have some concern because uh, it, it might reflect the kind of uh, people I end up rolling with, but I, I have seen some games being played and, uh, you know, people, witnesses answering uh, questions before the question is asked because somebody else said something. Clearly there was some element of uh, tampering. I have also seen, uh, uh, you know, experts not answer the question straight or and even uh, witnesses saying, look, I'm having problems with the bundle. I'm having problems with the live transcript. I'm having problems here. Yeah, there's been a snowfall and you know, my, my internet is not very good. And I, I think where the arbitrators tend to struggle is you cannot make out if this is a genuine problem or not. And my experience is, and I, I do say that with uh, some, some caution, is most arbitrators are not very keen to draw an adverse inference on behavior where someone is saying, look, you know, things are not working out. I've done, you know, or be, being a little shifty about that or being prompted. I, th I think that that is a slight element of concern for me. But um, otherwise, I think, uh, it's it makes this whole system more uh, efficient and effective. Thank you. And um, uh, I, I see that Michael Fay, um, who's a BVI arbitrator, has um, uh, made a point on the Q and A. Uh, it seems to me that it's much easier to deliberate with fellow arbitrators uh, if you all know each other. I think it's more difficult if you don't know each other, especially if English is not everybody's first language. Now, um, I'm just throwing that open mainly to Natalie and Liz. Um, I don't know whether that's something, whether there's, where there's a difference uh, when you're all in a room together or where you're remote, it's, it's the same issue. I was, I was just about to say that, Nick. I, I, I think that's true, whether or not you are in person or virtual. Um, my own experience is, well, first of all, parties take that into account when they're picking the panel, whether or not um, you know, sort of the, the, the arbitrators will know each other because you are trying to, you know, particularly where the parties have a role in picking the wings, they want to have somebody who could be persuasive in making sure that, that their, their evidence is heard, otherwise impartial of course. Um, again, my own experience is because people recognize that this is a somewhat unusual compared to the years or decades that a number of us have been uh, professionally active, this is an unusual form. People make that much more of an effort to actually see each other um, and spend a little bit of time getting to know each other. So for example, where the first tribunal interaction was previously by conference call, where 
where you would have had no visual cues whatsoever, people now make more of an effort to get on a Zoom or WebEx or some other platform so that you, you see each other. And there's almost always some comment, you know, so bad that, that we can't get together in person, but at least we can see each other that way. So, you know, in, in some ways, it may actually be that much easier to build that kind of interaction among a tribunal where not everybody knows each other. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with, with Natalie. It, it's, I don't think the problem is aggravated by um, the online experience. I, I think sometimes it's easier to dive into an arbitration with co-arbitrators or a, a co-arbitrator and a chair whom you don't know than it is with the guys you've known, you know, all your professional life. So um, speaking for myself, I always enjoy working with people I don't know. It's, I mean, the, one of the great things about arbitration is that one meets colleagues from all over the world, from different backgrounds, from civil law backgrounds, from different um, industry backgrounds. I just think that's one of the blissful things. You're not sitting with the same old people every day. And um, okay, sometimes it's not easy if, English isn't everybody's first language, but um, I hate to say it, but people, um, everybody speaks English so well, so, and I'm ashamed that I don't speak all the languages that my co-arbitrators speak. And I mean, I'm afraid that's, you know, that's the problem with having English as a first language. It is the lingua franca, dare I say it, of a lot of commercial arbitration. Um, but I haven't found it any more of a difficulty. And um, we're, we're now all saying, yes, we must meet up in person one day um, soon. So I yeah. think actually it's improved personal relations between co-arbitrators because we do have to make more of an effort, as Natalie said. No, that's interesting. Um, thank you both. Um, and uh, uh, Francois, I... I I've seen a question from Gideon Cohen, which is actually uh, almost bang on what I was thinking of asking you. Um, so um, Gideon asks, what impact does the panel think the rise of remote hearings will have on parties selections uh, of arbitral seat uh, or, or location? And my question to you that I was intending to put, which I'm going to put anyway, um, uh, is uh, is the time zone of the arbitration centre now more important than physical access? <laughs> so, so they're equally important, I, I, I suppose. Um, physical access was never the 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 main USP of of arbitration centres and, and jurisdictions. I suppose um, you know you. You could be in Paris if you didn't have the right legislation um, supporting arbitration. Sure. You know, people would not choose that jurisdiction. I think, fr from an institution perspective, the, the time zone is irrelevant um, because we'll work twenty four seven to support arbitrations that we're administering. Um, and being an offshore jurisdiction, we 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 expect some of our clients, particularly clients out of Asia. Uh, not to want to travel to the BVI, partially for a smaller arbitration. So, you know, we, we, we're geared towards supporting those arbitrations on, on an Asian time zone, uh, which for Hong Kong, for instance, would be 12 hours ahead of us. Um, so that would turn our days upside down. Uh, but but, but this, this is fine. So I think, you know, I think time zone is important for the tribunal to manage together with the parties. Um, and, and, and that's why I think, you know, it, it's, I mean, it's better if arbitrators and parties are across the America, you know, the Americas, for example, if you stop having one arbitrator in Asia and, and two in, in New York, then, then you start having problems finding slots. But I think, arbitration has evolved as well i mean you know you don't have 10 hours of remote hearings on a given day uh, even if everyone is in the same time zone uh, the hearings are shorter most of the time with more breaks and so on and so forth so i think you know i think 
time zone didn't used to be an issue whatsoever and, and didn't used to be important for, for in-person hearings because everyone was obviously in the same time zone. Um, now it's just a, a, a new aspect that people need to take into consideration, but I don't think um, you know it, it's been a challenge. Um, I think people have adapted really. Yeah, okay, thanks very much. And I'm, I'm conscious that we've got um, 10 minutes or just under. Um, and so uh, the, there's one question that I wanted to ask, which uh, I accept um, when we were in um, a, a sort of preparation discussion, uh, I was told that it was a, it was a particularly weak question, um, but then no one could think of another, another one instead. So I'll ask it anyway. Um, and uh, perhaps if I could start with um liz responding to this um uh, can i uh, lob at you what you think the future of offshore arbitration is well i i think it's got to be good it's got to be brighter hasn't it in the light of our all adjusting to remote hearings we now like remote hearings or a lot of us do we now think it saves us time we think it saves us expense we think that um, it's a really useful way to conduct quite a lot of hearings, if not all of them. I would have thought that an offshore arbitration centre would be in a position, providing their technological infrastructure is good, would be in a really good position to take advantage of that, particularly if they're well placed um, uh, time zone wise, as Francois has, has mentioned. So I would have thought the future looks look looks bright for offshore arbitration centres. It's you know, depending I, on how you position yourself. That would yes, be my of course. view. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't no, please, go further and debate whether that's a good thing or a bad thing or whatever. That's for your PR people. <laughs> well, there's a reason why I've left the background up uh, behind me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's but, definitely no, so an I offshore think the view. Looks bright. <laughs> the sun is shining. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you. Um, and indeed, uh, um, you know, the pandemic has been tough, but it's got these benefits. Hurricane Irma was tough, but it had benefits of um, uh, of making sure that uh, the infrastructure here was capable of supporting remote hearings. Um, and, and I think that's been very important for the uh, for the BVI. Um, I, I want to just sort of throw it open. Uh, I see, Natalie, you've come off mute. Um, and I'm seeing that as a signal. <laughs> well, no, it was just uh, wanting to, to to chime in in vigorous agreement with Liz, as we found uh, uh, often happened as we were, were talking about these topics. Um, I think that what the pandemic has brought to offshore arbitration centers that would otherwise have taken longer, again, coming back to, to my theme, is it removed an obstacle for people learning about the offering. Right. Um, if the legal infrastructure is there, which it is in at least some offshore arbitration centers, including BVI, um, if the uh, uh, council are there, you know, sort of there's involvement of the local and international bar. If the arbitrator lists are there, so the people that you would want to sit in your hearing are either the same or of you know, sort of similar quality reputation and standing as you would find with other institutions, then frequently the only barrier to choosing a particular arbitration center um, would be whether or not you had confidence that they could handle the hearings that you have. And what the last couple of years have done is, uh, at least in my experience, level that playing field a little bit, right? If you have the, 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 the strength of the internet connection, the 24 hour service um, from arbitration center A and arbitration center B, um, then you have, and maybe coming to Liz's point, whether or not it's a good or a bad thing, at least from the perspective of the user, you have that many more choices. Um, and having a, an established track record over the last two years years shows that the offshore arbitration centers, let's say, you know, again, particularly BVI, can at a minimum keep up with the Joneses of the, the larger, more established arbitration centers, which I think is important proof of concept. Yeah, no, thanks very much. In, in fact, one other um, example of that was that um, I was involved in a discussion a couple of weeks ago in BVI Arbitration Week, where one of the questions came up uh, about um, uh, whether hybrid hearings um, were 
working? And the easy answer to that was, well, half the panel was in the room um, in the BVI uh, arbitration center and the other half of the panel were scattered around the world. Um, and so that exactly made the point that uh, hybrid hearings um, were possible. Um, now, I don't know whether anyone else wants to come off mute uh, and uh, say a few words uh, uh, to conclude. Um, that's a no. Um, so what I will do um, is, I think, um, give everyone the benefit of uh, an extra uh, four minutes in their day uh, after I've um, thanked everyone um, very much. We've been really very lucky to have such a, a fantastic group of people contributing to this panel. Uh, and uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and uh, thank you also to um, the audience. We've uh, had a great number of uh, participants uh, and some, some really great observations and questions. So thank you very much indeed um, to you too. Uh, and then, as I said at the beginning, uh, do feel free to uh, fill in the form for the, uh, for the BVI arbitration group. Uh, and uh, we look forward to working with you um, uh, on the support and promotion of uh, BVI arbitration in the future. So thank you all very much indeed. Really, really appreciate it. It's been a great discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank great fun being with all the panellists too. Indeed. Brilliant. Bye-bye. <laughs>